All right. All right, welcome to Current Affairs Taiwan. I'm Donovan Smith, and this is Michael Turton. Welcome to another edition of Guomindang. What are we going to call this? Food fight? <laughs> <laughs> well, if it was a younger Han Guo, it would be a fist fight, probably. <laughs> That's right. Our, one of the current candidates for president punched out and hospitalized a previous president. So um, that may That's be a first right. in history. That's right. You know, if, if you were to get elected, you could. Uh, that would be, be one of those uh, historical firsts, I'm sure. <laughs> Well, this week, uh, so much news about the hand campaign, uh, Terry Go, yep. so, uh, Terry Guo, so much going on. So let's start with the, the whole cyber thing that's going on with Han. Mm -hmm. Paul Huang came mm -hmm. out with a piece in Foreign Policy. If you've been following Paul Huang on Twitter, he's a very strong supporter of Lai and um, uh, was kind of disappointed when <laughs> Lai failed to win the nomination, uh, to win the primary for uh, the DPP, but he did come out with a fantastic piece, piling up all sorts of hints and circumstantial evidence and very strong indications that there was a team of cyber operatives putting out fake news, supporting Han. And Dunneman pointed out, "Hey, wait a second. We were talking about this what last back fall? in November? Yeah. yeah, last November. The line groups." <clears throat> The line groups, um, line followers, uh, this is something that, that I picked up and I wrote about in an article in the Newslands last fall. Um, and there was a, it was a TV, you know, one of the TV news shows, um, and I think it was CTI, probably it was CTI. It was, um, it was talking about Han's growth, and this was during the local elections last year. And I noticed there was a, a, a it was a pro-Han uh, woman speaking, and she was talking about how uh, Han Guoyu, his line supporters, line friends, uh, was growing very, very dramatically. And so I was looking at her numbers, and she's like, and then you can see at the beginning of September, and, you know, I mean, I forget the exact time. She's like, you know, on this day, it went up by 2,000, went up by 3,000. And then she abruptly jumped and say, and now he's got more supporters than Coenza. That was sort of her, her, the gist of her, her point. But I was looking at the numbers on the screen, and I realized that they went from 200,000 to over 300,000 in a single day. Now, whether that's coming from China, or his campaign bought a bunch of supporters, or where that was coming from, we don't know. Um, but the other thing is, is that in the same article, I also cited some uh, quotes from, which I believe you have the quotes. I think we do. Uh, uh, from the Taipei Times, again, also last fall. Yeah, here we go. The phenomenal rise of Han from cyberspace to the real world is a case in point for what web brigades could achieve by manipulating public opinion and using psychological warfare techniques, the source said. Apparently, these uh, Han followers had come from other countries. Yeah, it was like Venezuela, yeah, uh, right. Russia, Ukraine. People posting comments on his Facebook. Yeah, yeah. and they were all IP addresses. Uh, scattered around the world. Yeah. So it was a little bit odd that, you know, I, as far as I know, Han Guoyu does not have a big Venezuelan fan base. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, uh, so there was a, so th there's a long history of this kind of fishy stuff going on on um, social media, but like I pointed out in the article last fall, well, a lot of the social media numbers may be artificially boosted or um, I, that doesn't really change the fact that that he's got genuine support on the ground. He's got, you know, his rallies are well attended. Yes. Those are real people. They are not Venezuelans. They are not Ukrainians. Uh, they're genuine, actual <laughs> Taiwanese um, <clears throat> showing up at his rallies. So he, he's got a, a, a genuine large number of supporters, but obviously online he's getting boosts from... It, it looks like, you know, I mean, the Somewhere. suspicion would be China. You know? Oh, yeah. But so. uh, another thing that came out this week about uh, the South is the uh, Chinese have been buying up Taiwanese language radio stations mm -hmm. in southern Taiwan. And that uh, that seems to have been part of this Han uh, explosion as well. But it also showed up already last year. There were some academics talking on Twitter about it. The Chinese language uh 
Chinese language research, which had not been published in English yet, was showing that there had been a slight shift in over 40s towards a more China-centered ID rather than Taiwan-centered one. And I was wondering at the time, how the heck could that happen? And now we have the explanation. There's a lot of Chinese language propaganda out there coming from China, and it's been supporting Han. Mm -hmm. um, and this is this. Uh, I think it was it was uh, William Young who brought that up on William Twitter, Young, which Twitter. you shared. Yeah. Because uh, I'm not on Twitter. Well, technically I am. I just never use it. Um, but then there was this uh, excellent piece yesterday, uh, yesterday, the day before, on Ketagalam Media uh, about this. Um, uh, about this same topic, and the author wrote a lot about how um, <clears throat> uh, this person would listen to the radio, mo moved to Kaohsiung, and started listening to a lot of Taiwanese radio, and there was a shift starting about a year and a half ago, according yeah. to the author. That would make sense. Um, and it started talking a lot more about connections with China and Shanghai, and there was, you know, and there, generally these programs are not. <clears throat> They're about building community, and, um, <clears throat> and and that's what they've traditionally done, is that they're very, very community-based, they're very community-oriented shows. So the host is kind of like a hub for the community. Um, and it's generally listened to by older demographics, but it, and they don't normally talk that much about politics, but when they do, it tends to be pro-KMT or pro-China, and that was the shift. Yeah, that's very scary. <clears throat> And now um, you can see the election is being organized. The KMT primary people are talking about how their line groups. Oh, my, my great aunt was telling me on her line group they were talking about Han. Oh, our line group is carefully telling everyone who to vote for. Wait by the phone when they call. Because remember, the KMT primary is a landline poll. Mm -hmm. so Entirely a landline poll, yeah. That's, <clears throat> that's why Wang Jinping was complaining about it last week. Mm -hmm. So the, the candidate that it suggests is going to be the candidate that's preferred by the kind of people who sit by their landlines waiting to be called by the KMT. Yep. <laughs> so, mm. all right. Um, Han had a busy week, went to graduation at high school. <laughs> <laughs> now this is, um, <clears throat> I had uh, a visit, a visit a visitor uh, from um, high school, high school friends of mine uh, in Taipei, and I was trying to explain uh, why Taiwanese youth and the way that they protest should be a model for the world. Uh, I was right. commenting on this also on uh, John Raychen's page. Yeah. Um, and the, <clears throat> if, you, if you look at, like for example, if, you know, in the last election there was, you know, there, you know, there was Trump running and there was Sanders running, and protesters would show up, mostly at the Trump rallies, but occasionally at Sanders rallies. But generally, it was the the formula was something along this along these lines. The protesters would go in, shout and scream, often including obscenities, and then they're trundled out. And they generally just look like obnoxious people. They don't usually communicate very much of a message if you can make out what they're saying. Right. And, you know, there's a very good chance that they're just you know screaming. Obscenities, <laughs> and then basically what happens is those protesters go back and they feel all good about themselves, and their buddies can pat them on the back and you stood up to the man, yeah. But it doesn't accomplish anything at all. In, in fact, I'd argue that it actually increased the support for who they're protesting rather than decreased it. I don't think anybody at the, for example, use the Trump rallies, for example was went oh yeah that was a well reasoned thought out point i think i'm going to change my support now I, you know <laughs> it just doesn't work that way well, the taiwanese students have it much better taiwanese students i think are the best protesters in the world bar none and the reason i say this is taiwanese students you know everything from the sunflower movement to you know these students you know basically <laughs> making fun of, of Hangul. What did they do? They came up with a thoughtful protest. Yeah. The, you notice that they're not rude. They're not offensive. No. Nope. They made, but they made a clear and cr uh, point using creativity. Like there was that one uh, student and she had her diploma, I think it was, or an award or something. And then she folds out two pieces of paper uh, and I can't remember which one of the slogans it was, but it, the slogans are generally along the lines of keep your promise and yeah. stay as mayor, don't run for president, <laughs> don't lie, um, 
But these were these subtle and creative. There was another student, she'd made kind of like a sash right. with circular. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, and the student with the book, why do you love lines? Yeah, yes. why do you? <laughs> <laughs> so these, are, these students are both, they're, they're not rude, they're not shouting, they're well behaved, well comported. They send a message that is thoughtful and creative. The press eats it up and people actually give it some thought. Yeah. And I think that, you know, I don't know how many people it sways, but it's got to be a lot more effective than, you know, than, than the way that, you know, we right, protested right. In, our, in our countries. Right. Now, I'm not saying that Taiwan, it, traditionally, was very much like overseas. I mean, after all, Taiwan became famous for fighting in the legislature. So, you know, that old school kind of, well, it, it, but it staged. seems like protests in Taiwan have evolved. Yeah. Whereas they're not evolving in the U.S. or in Canada or in Europe, it's still the same old shouting at the top of your lungs, right. nobody listens to right. you, except you're basically just preaching to the choir is really all that's happening. But the Taiwanese students, their creativity in getting their message, and the press eats it up. Yep. And it's indicative, I think, of how Han has fallen. Mm -hmm. The press, not only is the press eating this up, but, it's, but these students can just walk out on stage and do this to him. Yeah. And they don't feel like that he's some god whom they must respect. Yeah. So it's it's really good to see that. Yeah. And, and what else happened with Han this week? The police showed up. Yes. Knocking on his door. <laughs> I expect this is gonna be the first of many. <laughs> okay, so he was previously the Taipei Agricultural Produce Marketing Head or something. Something. Yeah. yeah. He's a director of essentially it's a it's a it's a quasi State owned. It's cooperative. It's a cooperative, but yeah. it's large. It's like a, a large percentage of it is owned by the Taipei city government. Right. And <clears throat> so this is Han, Han Guoyu's job uh, before. So he was Dan Han, the cabbage man, <laughs> um, <laughs> before. And that's why you see a, 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 a lot of his uh, pictures and a lot of his campaigning. He pictures himself as a businessman. Right. Well, this really wasn't a business, it was a a, a state owned and quasi, it's a quasi state company. Right. Um, but that's why he always has those cabbages in, in his, um, his uh, campaigning. And in fact, my very first memory of him was him with, these, with his, um, his hand, and he, he like sprawled himself over this giant mound of cabbages. In the KMT. And the funny thing was, because it was, it was that image when he was running for the... KMT um, chairman. KMT chairman. Yeah. <clears throat> and so, of course, I looked at his name, Han Guoyu, and the first thing I thought, cabbages, Han Guoyu. And I thought, and my nickname for him was Kimchi. Kimchi. Immediately right there. It was just like, that was, you know, <laughs> although now I'm going with Dan Han, the cabbage man. Yeah, I, I like that's it. better. <clears throat> but, so, anyway, uh, yeah. So. So the police, the, uh, he's being investigated for... It's only 4 million NT, it's like piddling. Mm -hmm. But according to the report, while head of this organization, <clears throat> Han created a leisure stress relief tour scheme <laughs> derived from surplus revenue not included in the accounting records and without the approval of the board of directors. The report also alleges that Han personally selected the employees who received these travel abroad awards, which would represent a serious breach of trust. And this is from an article in, what, Taipei Times? Yeah. Yeah. Or uh, this, actually, I can't remember. It was written about in the Taipei Times, CNA, and Taiwan News. I can't remember which one. Yeah. Was. So, and, and also his wife apparently his wife got some of the funds. Got some of the, yeah. That's what they're alleging. So this is, a, anyway, this is a stress relief. <laughs> stress relief tour. I need one of these. <laughs> okay, so, anyway, <clears throat> uh, hopefully this will all have a happy ending. Um, so, <laughs> <he's> be... <laughs> the tour? <laughs> Where exactly is it going? <laughs> So, okay, so uh, now it doesn't necessarily, this sounds tacky, m misusing funds. It's, it's probably business as usual in so many I, I sus Yeah, that's kind of the feeling I got. Yeah. It, it may be technically illegal, but they tend, it, it's dispersing perks to your buddies right. when you're in a position but of the, power. The, and wealth. The key point here is that this isn't going to be the only one. Mm -hmm. There's probably more. So there might well be quite a bit more out there that we, we don't, which hasn't come to light yet. But anyway, so he's being uh, investigated now. Um, 
And then, of course, we have the three. The fake three links. <laughs> the fake three Woo links. <laughs> Ferry boats directly to Gene Martin. <laughs> yeah. Or Xiaomi. <laughs> it was to, uh, no, it, it was uh, Wenzhou or something. Yeah, yeah something like in that. In China, anyway. So here's a, uh, this was organized by a shipping company with no ships that had closed a few weeks ago, I'd like seized to exist, although they claimed that they were going to lease some boats. They claim that they're creating these, these new cross-strait links to China without any government approval, which of course they have to be approved. <laughs> and they brought all these people to their launch event for their non-existent, non-approved uh, you know, links to China. Right. And they claimed it was going to be at this wharf, but they actually held the event in the park next to it because they didn't really have the wharf. <laughs> now, the part that was embarrassing for Han Guoyu, um, he does not appear to have been involved in this in any way, but his Minister of Tourism, his or department head of the Tourism Department for the Kaohsiung City Government, went and supported this event. So uh, Han Guoyu had to come out and apologize for that. Looks, this is what happens when you're the itinerant mayor of Kaohsiung. <laughs> As Keone Everton, the Taiwanese, constantly puts it. <clears throat> yeah, in every single article. Yeah. And there's a recall petition out. That's right, the recall petition. They only needed, what, 22K people. There's, it's several stages, but the first stage, they need 1% of the voters, yeah. which is like 22K people in Kaohsiung. The second stage, they need, what was it, 228,000 Okay, signatures? so this is where it gets tricky. Um, so the first stage, yeah, they need to get 1%, 22,000. Then the second stage, in 60 days, they have to get 10% of the local electorate yeah. or 228,000 residents to right. sign on. So for that, you need some muscle. You, you need a lot of people out on the ground canvassing to get those signatures. Right. That's, that's a physical, logistical... And for what? And for what? Now, here's the thing, is that if they succeed at doing that, then, to recall the mayor, 25% of Kaohsiung's electorate must vote in favor of recalling him with the number of yes votes exceeding the no, 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 votes. no votes. So now that is, so this group here, We Care Taiwan, uh, estimates that they would need uh, 600,000 yes votes to, uh, so it, it's, it's possible, uh, but it's tough. He's going to step down if he gets the if presidential nomination. If he becomes president, yes. So, <laughs> <clears throat> so, yes, if he gets a presidential nomination, which he may not, mm -hmm. we don't know yet, um, then he, yeah, then... Well, there's not much, I don't think there's, anyway. <laughs> yeah. Forget it. <laughs> we're a long way from seeing anything coming out of this. So what were the polls saying? The polls are, hand and go are basically close. Mm-hmm. But both of them are decisively losing in two-way battles to Tsai Ing-wen, usually by double digits. Mm -hmm. So, but if Ko Wenja enters, he takes a few votes from Tsai, mm -hmm. and then he squeezes her down to single-digit leads. Yeah, but high single digits, like 7, 8, 9%. Yeah, so that's <clears throat> and still double digits over Terry Go, for example. Um, and but she hasn't started campaigning, mm, as we say. Not week. exactly, yeah. <laughs> um, <clears throat> She's out there. She, I mean, she, she's messaging, so she's kind of campaigning. Um, but, yeah, so basically the, you know, right now, it could go either way with either Han or, or Terry Go, uh, uh, Guo Taiming. Um, I think, I still think that, that Eric Chu needs to be, or Zhu Li Luan, uh, I think pe people should keep an eye on him. He's been rising uh, in the polls the last couple of ones I've seen. Um, he's, still, uh, he's still only in the, you know, 15% versus the 25 or so, which right. uh, Terry Go and Han are. But it's worth noting that I think it, it, the thing is, I think that there's a certain percentage of the Pan Blue electorate who probably are looking at Han and, and Go and are going... Do we really want a populist? Right. And so the non-populist candidate uh, option here is Eric Chu. Right. Um, and he's a more traditional politician. He's, he's got experience. He's got a lot of experience. He's a two-time, a two fairly popular 
uh, mayor of the biggest city in the country. Yes. <clears throat> you know, by most accounts, he did he did fine with with that job. Fairly popular, reelected. Has experience running for president. Yeah, he has. Even if he's off, so, <clears throat> so he's been, uh, you know, he's been well vetted. Yes. Which uh, both Han and <laughs> Go are. Just, I mean, just what we already know about these guys is 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 concerning. Um, uh, but Eric too is pretty well vetted. He, you know, he seems to be, you know, family man. He's, he's got rational. The, he's rational. He has um, public policy prescriptions. He knows what he's talking yeah. about when he talks. Yeah. So I I, I, I expect him to keep rising uh, in the polls. I think he'll do fairly well. I don't know if he'll win it, but what if you're it's the, possible. What if you're the party center and you're looking at these three guys saying? Which of these people is going to have coattails to pull people into the legislature? Which of them is going to have the local factions out there, you know, getting getting the votes out? See, now that's an interesting one. Not Terry Go. Not Terry. Well, here's the funny thing: is of course everything's so top. Go's got to court. Point. He's got to court them. <laughs> yeah. Now Hang Guoyu, he got them last time because Wang Jinping. Right. Fu Huanxi from Hualien is in Han Guoyu's camp, but Han Guoyu, when he came to Taichung last time, the both That's the right. red and the black factions would not join him on stage, but they were willing to have dinner with him afterwards. So um, they're, they're hedging their bets on him. Terry, Terry Go. <clears throat> I, the thing is, is it's pretty clear that Wang Jinping is pretty upset with Han Guoyu at this point. So Wong has been meeting up with Terry Go. Yeah. Well, the interesting, but but both Han and Wong, at least from the way I see it, they're just one nasty comment away from sinking their candidacy. Han Guoyu doesn't make nasty comments. No, I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, but you know what I'm saying? They're, yeah. He's just one verbal trip up, let's put it that way. Possibly. I don't More you know. than, less than Go. You're right. I, I feel like Han Guoyu, he, he's very good at his his supporters, I think, are very loyal to him. That's true, um, and I think that. But outside he, of that, he can he can't. I don't think he can grow beyond what he has now. Right. Um, I I don't see him getting any significant support beyond his his his, his core. Now, if he becomes the KMT candidate, he'll get some of the supporters of the other candidates. Right. Just simply because they're going to be loyal to the KMT, but I don't see them being super enthusiastic about him. I I don't. No, I think he's got an enthusiastic core, and they're they're very loyal to him, and they're sticking by their man, and he can say some pretty weird things, um, yeah, and they're gonna stand by him, yeah, you know, um, the the weird things are it's very interesting what he says, yeah, so uh, you, uh, where do you start? No, <laughs> you don't want to start, but that's what I think yeah. when, you, when you listen to him and he's gonna try and win over seventy five percent of the vote. Yeah. That doesn't support him. And and the things he says. And yeah. Guo Timing still running his get off my lawn candidacy. <laughs> and his his latest his latest jabs were directed at the pro China media. <laughs> we were laughing so hard. Which is there's something going on. Okay, so we've got now the two biggest or or at least two some of the biggest uh, invest Taiwanese investors in China are Terry Guo Taiming and Tsai Ang Meng, who you say his English name is Robert, Robert which Robert I learned Tsai. from you. Uh, Robert Tsai um, of the Want Want Group, uh, which of course has China Times, CTI TV, and all you know all this <laughs> uh, media. Now, obviously, there's some bad blood between these two, and I don't know why. What the history of it is. Or it could be that the, the bad blood is, is new, but <clears throat> basically the Wang Monk Group media has continued their support for Han Guoyu. Right. And it's interesting how Go framed that as the pro-China media. Yes. That's very yeah. interesting. <clears throat> um, Thus placing himself on the Taiwan side of that divide. Yep. He's not a bad politician. No, he's not. He's actually been saying a bunch of things recently which are, are which makes sense for a politician. Yeah. But, on the media part is, of course, now it's there's some chatter about UDN seems to be more pro Terry Terry 
Terry Go. Terry Go, Terry Go. So we've got the <laughs> go uh, the the pan blue media now, and so, which raises the question because we, we know that both of them make staffing decisions and a certain amount of their editorial decisions run it through Beijing. I mean that has been openly right. stated by right. the National Security um, <clears throat> uh, Agency here in Taiwan. So. <clears throat> um, so we know that they're doing that, but the question is, is uh, you know, are, are there different people in China who have different, are they backing different people? Do, I mean, do they know in China who they're supporting? I, I, you know, we know that they they like Terry, Terry Go. We know that. Previously, they liked Han Guoyu. Right now, I don't know if they've made up their mind which one they prefer. I don't, I, I just can't, I don't think they care. Actually, as long they as might it, not. It, man, to me, this looks just like a, an internal KMT. Yeah, I suspect yeah. it is, and it, it has, I have a feeling it has a lot to do with the personalities involved. Hmm. Um, so yeah, so right now we've got Robert Tsai is taking his want, 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 want group, um, <laughs> and is sticking it to Terry Go. Uh, I don't know why. Um, but for some reason, so now Terry Go is refusing all interviews with want want people. Yes. With want want, because <laughs> they're they're too pro China. <laughs> okay. Oh, that's so, delicious. Yeah. Well. All right. So what do we got? We got two more things here. That was the NPP. Yes. Well, we got the five. Okay, the five candidates. Who were, never, never mind. Yeah. Never mind. Um, all right. So the, I guess the last thing here. Uh, and we're getting close to the 30-minute mark. NPP is considering running a candidate. Now that's they're the going to new power meet. party. That's the yeah. that's the party of uh, Freddie Lim, mm -hmm. the Chathonic band leader, and Huang Guochang, and my own district, Tanzit. Yep, and mine. Wow. Is Hong Ziyong? Yeah. Hong Ziyong, yeah. Um. She broke my heart. She got married a couple years ago. I know to the to the head of the information department here in, under uh, Lin Jiao. Uh, who I met, he's a, he was a nice guy actually. Um, <laughs> anyway, so she did well. You're he's just breaking nice my heart even worse now. I know, I know. You know, you're a nice guy too. Um, uh, but yeah, so basically, I mean, the, the NPP is considering it, and it's the legislator she uh, is brought that up as a possibility. Um, <clears throat> and uh, he, he, he's bringing this up. Um, Huang Guochang has already ruled out running uh, the, the Taipei legislator. Yeah. Um, no word from Freddie Lim. No word from Hong Ziyong. I, I would be surprised if either of them threw their hat in the ring. Uh, I can't I think, see them running against Tsai. I think both of them are fairly pro Tsai. It's yeah. anyone. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and I don't think there's anybody else in the party who's, except for maybe Xu himself, uh, who would be high profile enough. Now he's the one pushing, so maybe he wants to run for president. Maybe. You know, I, I don't know. Um, my suspicion is they won't run with it. I think that's not this election. Well. No, I don't think it would be good for Taiwan. It would be good for them as a party. Yes. Um, they need the experience. Uh, it would increase their profile. Yes. Uh, and it would mean they'd have a, a candidate on the news all the time talking about their, their party, yes. their agenda. So for them as a party, I think it would be a very good move. Um, for the pan-green pro-Taiwan independence or pro-Taiwan sovereignty side of the political equation, I think it would be a mistake for that. You know, politically, I don't it, know. It, would, it would damage, because Taiwan's she has really solid support amongst the young. Kuenza, who's our last topic here, uh, has uh, also very strong support among the young. Right. But that was really what tipped it for Tsai versus Lai Qingde was that the young did not really support William Lai or Lai Qingde in the DPP primary in a three-weight race, including Ke Pi. But they did swing to Tsai ing -wen. Yeah. Uh, and if the NPP ran a, a candidate, that would mean that some young supporters might go with Coenza, they might go with the NPP, they might go with Tsai, and that basically that's the the voters under forty that would suddenly get would have some some serious thinking to do. Yeah, it would be quite interesting. 
It might it might even benefit Cy if there's a lot of candidates Possibly. in the race. Which in brings long up, runs. <laughs> yes, right. And long team we'll runs. talk about Kyle P in just a second. <clears throat> Go ahead. Let's um, talk about Kyle P. Oh, just yeah. I mean, we, we, we might have four candidates. The, this the question is: Will this be a two, three, four, or five candidate race? Race. And by that, right. I mean ones that could get at least into the double digits. Well, timing hasn't promised that he won't run if he doesn't get the nomination. That's right. Yeah. And Wang Jinping has also not ruled out running right. as an independent. Right. The NPP may yet run a candidate. Uh, you know, I don't think James Sung will try it again, but he did get 12, 13 percent in the last election. Maybe Hong Shou Zhu will run for the new party. <laughs> <laughs> I want her back in the race. She's oh, my favorite candidate. I know. She was so <laughs> I miss much her fun. so much. <laughs> uh, okay. So what did Ko say? Give us some. Clues. All right. So all right. So this is um, uh, there was that whole big twin towers investment, um, which previously had a trouble attracting bidders, but they really want to build these nice big twin towers. You know, ar architectural showcase. Uh, in Taipei, down near the train station, and finally, Taipei City finally found a bidder. The bid won these very dramatic-looking uh, buildings. Um, now, the problem is, is that this Hong Kong-based consortium is largely backed by Chinese money. Of course. And so the national government, citing national security, shut it down. Um, pointing out that this is a major transportation and uh, communications hub right? Uh, by the Taipei main station. So, now, Ko Wenzo was not happy about this decision. So he said, the way I see it, talk of national vision and national sovereignty are bullshit, he said. Ko was asked to comment on reports that his stance had changed since, okay, so Moving on down, he, he, said, uh, he said, it took me three seconds at the time, he's referring to an earlier decision. Uh, it took the Democratic Progressive Party five months. Asked if he thought President Tsai Ing-wen was behind the commission's decision, Ke said he did not want to speculate, but added, quote, if you want, wanted to invoke, invoke national security and sovereignty, you only need three seconds to make a decision. You do not need five months. Next time, they should find a better excuse, he said. Asked why he disliked Tsai's leadership style, <clears throat> Ke said that instilling fear and hatred is a cheap but effective way to generate political mobil mobilization, but it harms the nation's <coughs> long-term prospects. Do you think that sounds like the words of a man who is not going to run for president? <laughs> I, you know, I've been thinking about this. He said before that, you know, when he was at the at the Mazu, Mazu pilgrimage in, in the Genmine Temple. And he said, he said he'd made, he'd already decided what he wanted to do, but then he was trying to convince himself whether it was the right decision. I think he's made up his mind to do it. He's taking all these trips around the country on the weekends, um, and I think he's trying to convince himself whether it's not a good idea. In other words, I think what he's doing is he's, I don't know what metrics he's looking at in his own mind. One one quote is, if Tsai hit 40%, maybe he wouldn't run. He's also come out and said, you know, I'm still waiting for the DPP and the KMT to convince me that their candidates could do a better job yeah, running the country. Yeah, he's said that. But he's flat out said, you know, he, he flat out clearly dislikes Tsai Ing-wen. Um, which brings up the question, I always wonder why, and I, I don't know. He's got a real beef with Tsai Ing-wen. And I'm kind of curious as to what's behind that. Um, but, um, but yeah, so I, I don't see, you know, I, I don't see the KMT candidates convincing him of that. No. But I don't see how he can look at the polls and imagine he can win. Well, see, here's the interesting <clears throat> thing, though. I mean, his, his, poll, his polls have been pretty steady. He's got 20-some-odd percent support. But he doesn't show any sign of growing. And if he's going to run yeah. around the country being another itinerant mayor, <laughs> no doubt County Everton will have a field day with this. Two itinerant mayors running around <laughs> trying to get votes God knows where, right? But it is interesting that he made the comment about uh, having made, that he made his decision when he was at the Matsu Temple. Yeah. Because Matsu is, is part of the cross-strait, uh, it's a nexus of cross-strait activity. Mm -hmm. The Chinese use that cult to uh, 
to influence politics in Taiwan. Yeah. And when Terry Guo wanted to run for president, that was one of the first things he did. He, he associated himself with the Matsu cult. Yeah. That was a year ago. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so it's uh, going to be a very interesting... And Terry Go said he was told by Matsu. Oh, that's right. He was told by Matsu. I wonder what yes. Matsu told Kopi. Yeah, I don't know. Did she say, I already I, talked you know. to Terry. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not going to happen. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, I can't imagine. <laughs> Wait, you're not Matsu. You're Guanyin Pusa, aren't you? <laughs> So, yeah, I'll go. I, I kind of want to riff on the giant statue that's not there. But anyway, um, that's local Taijung politics. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, so stay tuned. Our yep. multi candidate election is, is uh, going to be a lot of fun to watch. The yep. KMD primary is going to be a lot of fun to watch for the next couple of weeks. Definitely. So be sure to check out that, KM, uh, that, that article on. Um, uh, the foreign policy article from Paul Huang, Paul Huang out this week. Uh, definitely check out the Ketagalan Media piece on radio. Um, on the radio, uh, that was that was a very interesting uh, and informative piece. I thought uh, you can check me out. I was interviewed uh, on uh, our RTI Radio Taiwan International, so I'll be on both radio and on video with Natalie So um, on Taiwan Today. Fantastic. Yeah. Congratulations. Yes. And, and you quoted look great you. too. And you quoted me. Yes. Wow. I owe you another beer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you very much for tuning in today. We'll see you next week.